Good morning, everybody. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk is uh, MRuby on Small Devices. Um, by now, you are all introduced to MRuby. There were two talks on MRuby, one by Eric and one by Kosovan. I'm sure I'm butchering the name. Um, so I did not tell you what MRuby stands for. Uh, let's. OK, so MRuby is uh, the minimalistic Ruby, um, um, which is considered as, as a lightweight sibling of Ruby. Uh, complies with part of the Ruby ISO standard. Um, it's sponsored by uh, this institute in Japan. And uh, I'm going to be following a convention of using uh, the name with a capital R, MRuby, as the language and MRuby as the interpreter with a smaller r, just as we do Ruby with a capital R to indicate the language, and Ruby with a small r uh, to indicate that it is an interpreter that I'm talking. So for the rest of the talk, that's the convention I'm going to follow. OK. Uh, all right, so MRuby the language uh, is derived out of this ISO standard. There is an ISO standard for Ruby, believe it or not. Um, and, but MRuby is not Ruby. It is a little less than Ruby. Uh, from my last count on the documentation of MRuby and Ruby, uh, I found out that MRuby has about 36 classes and seven modules, and not all classes that are there uh, have the same list of methods to the classes. So it's a smaller subset uh, of the larger uh, language that we know as Ruby. And I'm comparing that with Ruby 2.3, um, which has about 105 classes. Uh, and uh, 19 modules, okay? Uh, the syntax is compatible with 1.9 version of Ruby, not 2.0, because uh, it was conceived before Ruby 2.0 came. So MRuby, the work started in around 2010 is what Matt told me the other day. Uh, it has the more liberal license, the MIT license, so you can uh, use it for fun and profit. Um, so why, why do we think we should use something like MRuby? Well, uh, the stated purpose of MRuby is that it is used for embedding and linking. Um, and as we all know, we are in the age of small devices, right? We have Fitbit talking to my phone, talking to uh, something out in the cloud, controlling my uh, Philips Hue, all these devices around us. And these are small devices uh, that we would like to control. And uh, for those small devices to be controlled using smaller uh, languages is, is one of the purpose of MRuby. Uh, so we want to embed it and link it. And uh, also because Maths is interested. So just as there is uh, Rinspan, there is Minchman, you know. Uh, MRuby is nice, and so we are nice. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about uh, it being lightweight. What I mean, what I understand as it being lightweight is that it uses less memory during runtime that the size of the executable that it generates is small, because it has to fit on those small devices, uh, that it consumes less CPU cycles. That means that it is a little fast, or fast enough, to drive that device. Uh, and it has minimal dependencies on external libraries. And we'll see what each of these mean in my demo part of this. So, so this talk is in two parts. I'll go through the slides, and then we'll go through some demos, OK? All right. So. Uh, small devices, what do we mean by small devices? Well, in this context, I'm talking of something like Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm sure you must have heard of Raspberry Pi, a single board computer. Um, there is a version of Raspberry Pi, which is called Raspberry Pi Zero, costs about $5, um, and has a CPU that has a 32-bit single-core CPU um, and 512 MB of RAM. Okay? So obviously, uh, everything that we do on this single board computer uh, has to fit in that kind of small device. It has uh, storage as micro SD. I have a bunch of those over here. And uh, we will have a Birds of Feather session soon where we will be able to hack uh, these Raspberry Pis. Um, my, uh, so that's, that's the spec of, of a Raspberry Pi. And I, I play with these Raspberry Pis for fun. Um, however, the one that I'm using today is a slightly beefier version because I had to do more things. I had to do demos, and I had to run this uh, presentation of mine on Raspberry Pi. So believe it or not, this is the first time I'm doing this uh, on, on a Raspberry Pi. 
uh, that is running here at, at the podium. Thank you. This is not driven by my laptop. I'm driving this on the small device. I mean, I'm talking of, of, of MRuby on small devices. It behooves upon me to, to run it on a small device, right? So a huge shout out to the organizers over here. I had made this special request. Uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised that they have heeded to my request. I thank the AV team for helping me out last night in figuring all this out. Um, so, so Raspberry Pi for fun, uh, you know, and we will see all that fun just here shortly. Uh, I also do it for profit. Uh, I work for a company that, uh, 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 it's a credit card company, for, uh, which is a closed loop credit card system. Uh, not many people here may use it unless you have trucks, a fleet of trucks, or a fleet of jets or, or yachts or something like that. Um, uh, we have fuel cards, and these uh, FBOs are, are the places where you tank up your, your jet or truck or whatever it is that you use our card for, uh, has these uh, point of sale devices that are small devices, okay? Now, they compare to this Raspberry Pi, they are kind of bulky, you know, and heavier, but look at the specs. We are talking of 200 megahertz of ARM9, 32-bit RISC, which has 6 MB, okay, of RAM, of which only 2 MB of SRAM is available for my, for my program. So my program, if I have to, I have to run anything that I do uh, on that device, it better fit in 2 MB. We are talking of 2 MB here, okay? And these are still out there in production. Uh, more beefier versions of these devices are out there, uh, but, you know, we have to support the, the lowest common denominator, and so these are the kind of devices that I have to program on. And I thought, well, maybe it would be nice to have these devices uh, or run MRuby on those devices. Uh, I tried very hard. It's a, a, an uphill task. I haven't gotten that there yet. But that's, that's my ultimate dream, is to be able to drive one of these devices using MRuby. Um, how is that possible? Well, let's see. So this is the company that I work for, a uh, shameless plug. We are hiring. We have Perl, Ruby, Rails, Ember, Oracle, C as our stack. Uh, go to our website, there is a now hiring uh, uh, link to on, that, on the uh, homepage and you'll see what we are interested in. So uh, hit me up after the talk if you're interested in doing something like this uh, as a career. Okay, so let's talk about embedding and linking. Uh, we saw in the talk yesterday that we have uh, uh, embedding. What, what we mean by embedding is you take a, a Ruby script and embed it inside of C. Uh, most of the Ruby, Ruby code that I will be showing today will have some C uh, component to it, okay? Uh, we will, of course, run the MRuby interpreter, but uh, what I'm doing here is I am creating that string, as you can see, put as hello world, and I'm loading that string into the MRuby evaluator, and it loads the string and executes that string, and then it closes the evaluator. So that's, that's the minimalistic kind of approach to embedding uh, a Ruby script inside of, of C. Uh, and then linking, right? We are talking of embedding and linking. So how do we link this? We, on, on my system over here, we have GCC uh, as the compiler. Uh, I have invoked the compiler flags on the first line. I give the path to include the MRuby headers that are required by the C code. How many over here uh, do C? Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm not talking to an audience that does not know what, what this is all about. All right, at least some of them understand what I'm doing here, and I'm linking. That's where that linking comes in. The uh, the the uh, uh, Ruby library uh, libmruby.a is where it gets linked into my C code, and then of course it creates a uh, an executable, and I execute that hello just like any executable on that device, or in this case on the Raspberry Pi, and it would execute and run the Ruby code that was embedded inside of C. Okay, so how do we get that uh, MRuby? Well, uh, to install MRuby, you have to have some prerequisites. You need to have Git, because I'm going to install it from the source. Uh, you need GCC to build. Uh, MRuby itself is written in C. So you need GCC, you need a parser generator called Bison on, uh, on a Linux platform. I don't know what is the equivalent of this on Windows, but you would need something like this. Uh, and then you do need Ruby. Now that's, uh, 
That's one of the difficulties that I'm having in having mRuby compiled on the device, okay? If I have to compile mRuby on the device, I need Ruby on that device, which, you know, uh, is a challenge for certain class of small devices. But for Raspberry Pi, um, that's not a problem, especially the one that I have here up here. Uh, that's not a problem. I first installed Ruby, got all these things done, and then I compiled it using, um, from the source, I cloned the Git repo and just .mini rake, and it compiled mRuby for me, all right? So that's how I got mRuby on the device, running on my Raspberry Pi. All right, what it does then, it generates a bunch of binaries, and uh, some of them are obvious, like the interpreter gets generated after compilation. You get an interactive shell just as Ruby has IRB, mRuby has MIRB. Uh, you get the compiler that will compile the bytecode into uh, uh, a symbol table or the actual executable. And then we have the debugger to debug your code. And then we, I just learned yesterday that there is a way to remove the debugging information from, from, the debu uh, from the code that it generates. And that's where you use uh, Ruby strip. Thank you, Matt, for helping me on that one. All right, so that's what it generates when you run uh, mini rake uh, on the source. Okay, so let's see what I mean by embedding the bytecode in C. Uh, here I have a simple one-liner uh, Ruby program called hello.rb. All it does is put as hello world. Um, if I compile that, uh, hello.rb, it would generate a bytecode. And uh, it would generate it in a file called hello.mrb. Okay? So it's a, uh, it's a bytecode that the mRuby compiler would, would understand how to interpret that bytecode. Um, uh, it's, it's a binary file, so if you want to see, open and, and see what is in there, you would need something like hex dump to see the contents of this file. All right? And then uh, to run this bytecode uh, on uh, using mRuby, uh, you will have to give that flag uh, the minus b for bytecode, and sure enough, it will interpret the bytecode and do what you asked it to do, which is to put as hello world uh, uh, on the std out. Okay. Um, you can also generate the bytecode as a C array. Okay. So in the second example here. The same, same file, uh, however, you see that I'm passing uh, a, another uh, command line argument here called uh, hw underscore symbol. It's just a name I made up with a flag of minus capital B this time for the same program. It produces a symbol table, which is nothing but an array uh, in C, uh, an array declaration in C. Uh, and you have to include that generated file into the file that you want to embed it in, uh, which is on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, and then instead of uh, uh, loading the string, you can see that the load uh, function is now using irep, which is the inter intermediate representation of, of that bytecode. Okay? So it is reading that symbol table that you have created using the previous command. And then, of course, when you compile this code, just as we did in the, in the earlier uh, case as we saw it, I compile it using a magic shell script, which we'll see here very soon. Um, Compile it, and when you run the executable, it does what you want it to do. Uh, the compiler, again, it's no surprise, uh, except here I've given the path that I used, um, and it compiles um, the code. Okay, so mRuby itself, as you may have known if you've uh, listened to the earlier talks on mRuby, uh, the way you generate gems, there is a a gem generator for in mruby called mrb gems uh, you can configure the one of the nice things about mruby is it's very modular you can pick and choose which part of ruby uh, you want or mruby you want in the compi uh, in the compiled version of your mruby so you can make your own version of mruby with gems included uh, or, or compiled into it baked into it and that is by virtue of this uh, library manager uh, and the way you do that is you open up the build config.rb that comes with the source code when you clone the, the Git repo and modify the, the config.rb to include or exclude the gems that you want to have in your binary. Uh, there is no require in mruby, okay? So everything that you do, you have to kind of 
build it into the configuration file, and it generates one single executable, which we will see here very soon how to do that. Um, and there are multiple options of doing that. Uh, you can pull it straight away from Git uh, or GitHub or Bitbucket. The, it has interfaces to these uh, repos. Uh, and then when you compile this, again, using the .mini rake, you get your own version of mRuby, which is slightly fatter or thinner depending on what you have included or excluded um, from the, the out of the box or the default set of mRuby. Uh, and then most of the embedded world actually is driven by uh, another embedding language called Lua, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which has been around for a long time, so it's, uh, it's not really fair to compare, but you know, we, should, we, we should try to aim to come, come to that level. Uh, Lua is a prototype-based language, uh, has no classes, it's much simpler uh, than MRuby, uh, has only those uh, data types available in it. Um, it also compiles into bytecode, has a stack-based C API. I don't know if it is true that MRuby also has stacked, uh, stack-based C API. It, Matt's? Okay. Um, and then the VM, however, in Lua is register-based, which is a slightly more complex version of VM, but it also makes it faster. Uh, and so because the language itself is smaller than in Ruby, it's going to be faster. Uh, it came out in 1993, while as uh, MRuby came out in 2014. So there is that difference of you know, timing in how much uh, work has gone into Lua that makes it faster. And Lua has a Lua JIT, which is just-in-time compiler. I don't know if we have uh, M MRuby JIT, but I have seen on the internet that some people are working towards it. Uh, I don't know that it is still uh, considered as production-worthy yet. Okay. So uh, a Lua uh, example also looks very similar to uh, uh, our MRuby example in C. This is an example of, uh, of uh, embedding Lua script inside of the C code, just like we, say, we saw earlier. Um, except in this case, I am loading up a file that has the Lua script in it. So this uh, line on the right-hand side, which says Lua underscore do file, hello.lua expects that there is a Lua file existing in that directory that it reads, which has the Lua script in it. You compile that Lua, uh, C, the C code. Um, I haven't been able to figure out how to do that on my Raspberry Pi. I was able to do it on, on, my, uh, on my Ubuntu uh, laptop, but not on Raspberry Pi because it requires some installations that I couldn't quite figure out. But yes, when you compile this, apparently it will run the code that is in hello.lua. And you can see that it is just about as simple as it is in MRuby. So that was their intent from the get-go. That was what Lua was designed for. And it was surprising to me that MRuby comes so close to making it as simple as this. So again, it's a testament to Matt's uh, design genius. Um, OK, so this is a part of the demo. Uh, this is where we will switch over to demo. However, if you are interested in uh, learning a little bit, Rua, Lua is, uh, sorry, MRuby is so recent that we don't have books yet on it. Uh, you have Stack Overflow, and uh, the Git repo itself serves as your way to communicate with the authors uh, of MRuby or the contributors of MRuby. Uh, I believe there is a IRC channel where you can jump in and ask questions, um, or you can ask Matt when he's around. Uh, these two guys are, uh, I have seen a lot of videos of people using MRuby, but these are probably one of the best videos that I have seen. They have written MRuby on, uh, on an RTOS. Uh, absolutely fabulous work uh, done by these two people. Uh, okay, so before I switch over to my demo, uh, I also have uh, uh, some announcements. So this, I'm going to keep this Pi running for you guys. Okay, and so you can SSH into uh, my Raspberry Pi and hack it to your heart's content. Uh, I will give you the IP address soon here, right after when I go into my session, uh, demo session. Uh, you can SSH into it, that's the password, and it, 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 it does not have sudo access right now, this account, but if you need sudo access, let me know. Uh, after I, finish my, after I finish my presentation, I will open it up for you guys for doing whatever you want to do. Uh, the, the hard disk on this is a little micro SD card. 
Uh, so you can do whatever you want to do on, on, on the Raspberry Pi. You guess it's going to get formatted right after uh, the conference is over. So, <laughs> OK. So now let's go to the demo session, which is, uh, again, I'm doing this for the first time. I believe this is still the address. Can somebody confirm that they can SSH with mruby at 10.35.5.141? And then give, give rubyconf 201. I think Prathamesh there was trying it a few minutes ago. I just want to make sure that we are still on. It depends on Wi-Fi being available. You're on? All right. OK, so feel free to uh, play around um, uh, on my Raspberry Pi while I'm doing it. Uh, I will open it up for you to try out certain things. OK, so the few things that I wanted to do in the demo today, how much time do I have? This, this it counts down, right? OK. Uh, OK. Um. Oh, 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 sorry. I want to show you what, what I mean by binary file being small. And remember I said it's lightweight means the binary has to be small and it has to have less dependencies uh, uh, on the operating system. The devices that I use to program it on uh, the POS devices, by the way, are devoid of an operating system. So I'm coding right to the metal, okay? There is no operating system. Everything that I need on that device, I have to compile it in my code, cross-compile it, sorry, in my code, and effectively my code is the operating system uh, on those POS devices. However, over here, we have a much richer environment, and so, um, Okay, so you see here, this is where I have compiled the mruby. Uh, MIRB is a little over 1.5 megabytes, so it will fit, uh, or mruby is a little over 1.5 megabytes. So my, my, my limitations on that POS were that the program should be less than two megabytes. So this will run, uh, Ruby may, may or may not run. Um, and the dependencies, you can see those dependencies by doing LDD uh, on, on uh, on Raspberry Pi. The operating system that I'm using here is called Raspbian, okay? The Raspbian is the, uh, the operating system that the, the company that produces Raspberry Pi has come up with. It's a variant of uh, Debian, all right? So these commands are pretty much available, on, I think, on all Linux platforms. So if I do uh, LDD on mruby, you will see that it depends on these many uh, uh, runtime libraries, the .so files, okay? However, if I had done this on uh, Ruby, okay, uh, on on the same on the same device, you would see it has slightly more dependencies. So that's what I meant by it has to have less dependencies on it, okay. Uh, and also, if you see if you saw the size of a Ruby, it would be definitely larger. I I don't know how to see the size because when I try to do size, I think there is a command called size on mruby, yeah, see all that? Uh, when I try to do the same thing on the version of Ruby that I have, uh, oh yeah, there you go. Okay, so here is the thing. So the, when you look at the size of the compiled version, sometimes it is deceptive because it might have a small size, but it depends on a whole bunch of other things. And so when we consider the size of the entire uh, application, you have to take into consideration those things. So this, this can be confusing. So be, be careful about how you measure size of, of a binary. Okay, so uh, that was... Uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of the size and, and memory. So, uh, also we want to see how much memory it consumes when it is running in RAM, right? So that's the other requirement that I have. I have only so much of RAM. Does it will it work or will it run out of RAM? Okay. Uh, the devices, like I said, that I have, uh, I want this to work on. Don't have page faults and, and any sophisticated paging mechanism. So everything that you want to run has to fit into the RAM. Okay, so the, for that purpose, what I have done is, let me, uh, uh, 
uh, what I've done is I've written a little, I've, uh, I've found this. So here, I'm going to run Ruby, okay? And uh, here, I'm going to say, call this name, sorry, Ruby. Okay, and it shows that it is using about 6.14 megabytes of, of RAM. Okay, obviously this will not run on that small device that I was intending to run it on, all right? Uh, so how does it compare with MRuby? So let's look at that. Now I run MRuby in this panel, uh, and then run the same command for Yeah, this, this would work. This would work on that small device. So that's how I, I look at, so every program that you're running, you would want to use this tool, uh, and I will make these tools available on the internet, those that I have either uh, written myself or have got copied from somebody else. And they will all be available by the end of this uh, uh, conference on GitHub. Um, so that's how I look at the size of the memory that it consumes at runtime, not just the size while it is uh, on the hard disk compiled version, but also when it is running, actually in the memory, okay? And then the other thing that we want to see is the speed. Uh, how fast is MRuby compared to Ruby or Lua or whatever it is that you're trying to use as an alternate to embed uh, your code in? All right, so to do that, uh, I'm going to try to Go to my code. Oh, sorry. All right. So what I have done here is I have written a uh, Fibo.rb, which calculates the Fibonacci of a number. And I've used, this is not the most accurate version of Fibonacci because it might do wrong things depending on smaller values of n, such as zero and minus one and two and minus two negative numbers. But for, for the purpose of this particular demo, I think this would suffice. Okay, so I'm going to time this uh, with mRuby. So time mRuby, Fibo, RB. And MRuby took about, oh. it should take about eight seconds. The last time I measured this, it was taking around eight seconds to run uh, Fibonacci of 32. All right. Oh, it took 10 seconds today. Uh, benchmarking in this way is, is you have to be very careful about benchmarking stuff like this. I mean, just a couple of runs is not going to give you. There's a whole study that shows you how to properly benchmark uh, programs uh, against each other. Uh, but this is just a rough estimate of how it would look like when you ran uh, So MRuby took 10 seconds. Ruby took around four seconds because Ruby is probably using a lot of uh, resources and therefore making proper use of them, okay? So uh, the idea here is, okay, so let me see if uh, I have something else to compare it with. Um, there's no law. Um, the other thing, the other thing that I have to look at when I do these things is see how, how, how fast it takes to load the environment, okay? Because again, my devices have no operating system, so everything that I put on it has to load. And these are POS devices. They have to be constantly on, not crash, be fast, and everything, you know, because people are actually swiping their card and has to happen in, in real time. So the other factor that uh, comes to my mind is, uh, how do you load these devices? Let me just, I don't need this session here. Um, um, so I have a little shell script that shows how long, oh, 
not in the right directory, CD2. Okay, how long it will take to load? I think it is. Yeah, okay, so boot times. So that's the time it takes to boot your application. Um, so this shell script runs for different versions of the compiler. All it does is, so for example, let me show you what I'm trying to do. If you run Ruby on the command line like this, which does nothing, okay? It just runs and does nothing. How long does it take? And that's the time it takes for Ruby, the interpreter, to run. So if I time this guy, all right, uh, it took about uh, one tenth of a second to load up and do nothing. If I did the same thing with mRuby, see see the difference there, okay? Uh, if I did the same thing with Lua, see the difference there, okay? And I have on this, I believe there is Perl, so. I was comparing with a bunch of these. Uh, so this, this gives you an idea of how long it would take to boot things up when you first load the program, okay? So as you can see, we have, uh, we have okay, so let me cat this for you. Or, or, uh, so I had a Ruby, Perl, Python, Node, uh, MRuby and Lua in, in this boot program. And so when I, when I do this, okay, so let's see. Then let me scroll. Uh, you know, why is it not scrolling up? Huh, that's what's happening. Okay, so let's do this. Oh, so that's why, okay. So <laughs> it's the output of time is not going on standard out, it is going to standard error, I, be I believe that's why uh, I was not able to see it. Uh, but uh, let's, let's do this uh, at the command line then. Time. That's how long it takes to Python. Uh, Lua. So, so, so you get the idea. Um, so what what I have uh, uh, what I have seen is when I play around with mRuby, the biggest challenge that I have is to compile cross compile it for the devices uh, that I'm interested in running it on. And so one of, the, one of the hurdles that I'm coming up with uh, in getting this running on the POS device that I was talking about is not all the libraries that mRuby needs for it to run properly are on that device. So it's a, it's a challenging task for me to get that uh, mRuby working on the small device. Uh, but with support from the community, I might be able to do it. Uh, that is all I had for as far as demo is concerned. I have about eight minutes for question answers. Um, so, shoot away. Okay, so the question is, since I'm running it on a small device that is so constrained, uh, is, is there anything in the language itself that will monitor whether it is going out uh, or, or, or running out or cache? I don't think so. I, is there anything, Matt, that would tell me from within the program that so the answer there is that it is not there by default. You, if you want that kind of monitoring, you'll have to write your own code. 
for for most of these answers like the like these questions it is you know you you probably have to write it on your own if it is not there given so these compilers that the cross compilers that are available for those devices are very very pricey uh, the compilers themselves have a very stringent uh, uh, restrictions on what you can and cannot compile onto these devices because obviously we are playing with credit cards here so they do a lot of uh, checking of your code before they allow you and it has to be signed by two authorities before it can be loaded onto the device so um, one of the key things that I have learned in, in playing with these is that you need to know the operating environment in which you want to embed in before you can successfully embed and, and get it to work the way you want it to work. Any other question? Counting to three. One, two, three, no questions. Okay, thank you.